tonight we take a look at a couple horror icons as we ask the question, what do current family-friendly zoo attractions have to do with old horror movies and theaters? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome to Chaotic. What's happening, Lee? Good afternoon, Jay. How's it going? Oh, it's going. Got some uh got some interesting stuff and already uh already trying to answer that that question that I posed in the in, in the intro. What do but as long as it doesn't involve electrocuting elephants or Edison, I'm fine. Uh no, we don't we don't talk about uh at least electrocuting elephants in today's episode. A little bit other Edison allegedly. Oh no. Electrocuting elephants. Oh no, it happened because it happened at like Coney Island. There's oh, it was it was allowed by the uh animal cru- cruelty of America. It, it it really was. And you know, it's not and it's not unlikely only. under current tech tech levels that Edison's gonna sue me somehow. So Not only was it electrocuted, but it was also hung and poisoned at the same time. All three of them. Mm -hmm. And the CPA said that was the uh, most humane way that any animal had ever been put down to date. Somebody had been paid off. Well, well, I mean, look at our modern agricultural industry, though, too. Like, we are, our our, our culture has a history of liking, liking to hide how we deal with animals. Unfortunately. Whether we're eating, eating them or you have a cat, like a big cat in your house. Speaking of animals and zoos, I got the Central Park Zoo's uh, website up here right now. And I'm looking at some kids in a theater with some weird glasses on. Uh, it looks like some bubbles and foam in the air. And I don't know what else is going on. But what what is this? It's the 4D theater, an immersive experience featuring the visual drama of a 3D film with a variety of built-in sensory effects. It's quite an adventure, it says. Blah, blah, blah. But what is one of these things? Well, it's a 3D movie essentially combined with some effects, physical effects happening in the theater, right? So they got bubbles, they got air blasts, they got things that poke you, things that do whatever, all all in the spray with water, whatever. And it's a pretty cool idea if you've ever been to one of these. I actually have a trailer for... Uh, the company, a company that makes these, I believe. That noise again. <laughs> that noise. Water, fog, wind, earth, with your powers combined. <laughs> DX Motion Effects Theater is the newest evolution of the Heave up and down. In a total immersive environment where you Roll actually Roll left and right. So it's like those D boxes kind of plus like spraying you with stuff. Cinematic experience which stimulates all five senses, which includes high tech motion seats and special effects including wind, fog, lightning, bubbles, lightning, water, yo, rain, and sand. So lightning, the effect is lightning, not a thunder effect, but a lightning effect comes from the seat. So not the sound, not the vibration, but the actual like doom, zolt, jolt of electricity is what <laughs> they're saying. Uh, I have a feeling that that's not true. In both 2D and 3D formats. Ooh, vibration. Was launched in Seoul, South Korea in 2009, showing the movie Journey to the Center of the Earth. And since then, 4DX cinemas have been slowly opening around the world. As of 29th of August 2017, there are currently more than 370 4DX cinemas across the world. Ooh, it sprays you right in the face. And averaging two new cinemas opening every week. In 2014, America's oh, puts out sense too. Showing Transformers: The Age of Extinction. Well, that's the next thing in VR too. Oh no, this this, this does not sound like something that I want. Scent. Scent, smell. Well, you, like, you'll be able to turn that stuff off. 
Uh, not if you see in the video, it's like in the back of the other person's seat. So it's spraying out right in your face. And it's like, Fair enough. if you're in a horror movie and it's like all blood and gore, are you going to smell all of that? And like, if you walk into a rotting room, like a uh, rotting flesh, like do you, like, you, you do could, that? you could. All right. Say for They're example, in kids the, movies in where people rip farts and it's just going to have sulfur spray out. It's just going to be, this is not something I think I want to partake in. Let's cool back on the well, smell. Uh, a lot of people felt that way about seeing the shows they were listening to, though, too. Yeah, I did What? They had a similar similar reaction. A lot of but, people didn't like the idea of movies. They like they preferred the radio. They preferred yeah, stories on the radio. Plays predate both of those, so I would assume that like before that people had the visual thing like there was never a time in history where there was only a, an audible element until like the time of radio all before then you physically had to be there basically for the thing if you wanted to hear or see something right Fair so enough. like only till then and that's but smell i don't think that like ever back in like you know Shakespearean days with plays. They, I mean, smell was a thing, but I don't think they were ever like, hey, I got this idea. Let's waft in the smell for this certain I, scene. I think there's actually a pretty good history of that, even going back to Greek times, but I'd have to double check myself. I thought that was all, wafting smells was all invented by the uh, food industry, but. I, I think I think wafting smells is probably invented in prehistory, but that's just my personal well, opinion. I, I think they were trying to get away from smells at that time. Well, it depends what you're trying to get. If you want your neighbors to be scared, you leave their eviscerated carcasses between your house and theirs. I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Like, yeah, not you know, do it close smells. enough. That way it wafts to their cave. That way they know. Well, at one point in time, though, they thought smells were the thing that caused the disease. So, like, and that went, that went pretty far back that people thought that, like, the smell from the rot is what caused the spread of the thing. So people were, for a long time, very cautious of that. That goes... You know, that goes way back. It does room. go way back and up to the Victorian era. But but yeah, I mean, yeah, using it as scare tactics, that's a that's another thing for sure that was used. Well, even even just a scent, like say, for example, in horror, the revulsion of rotting meat could be a very effective motivator or like the, the, the coppery smell of blood, for example. If you're looking for like a good environmental scare, those are a couple that would probably be pretty effective. You get one of those plants that smells like rotting flesh and yeah, <laughs> blow air out in the audience. I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I mean, you could also argue that like being stabbed or cut or burnt in, at a movie while that's going on at the theater. Well, adds that's to the immersion. Smelling so, something like, that versus being cut. physically stabbed is not the same thing. <laughs> if it makes you vomit, then I don't know. That's a physical. Ah, that's that's just my word because that's that smells to do that to me. Like if they put out certain smells, be like, oh, dude, fuck this, and then I can't handle. How quick does that smell go away? And then you have to handle. Are they going to equip themselves with like the, like the Vegas style um, HVAC or you systems can, that suck you all can, the smoke out in like a matter of like quarter of a second? Or you know, someone could hack it, and you're now trapped in a theater with like you know, out of the control burning like vomit smell or whatever the heck somebody sets up. Yeah, exactly. Because of the immersive experience, theaters must be specifically designed for. And yeah, that's the thing you have to. Technology. They are saying that you have so to don't do a, 4DX a very specific theater. It has to be built to those specifications, to totally basically. Well, there's, there's one in Orlando. Not everyone can see a movie in 4DX. Well, I mean the you the zoos. That's where I started. At. Zoos have like a small version and of these, and I've seen those for years. Uh, they're always like dumb things like I showed it's like a little clip from like Ice Age or like a very specifically made thing that was like taken from IMAX and retooled into more kid friendly family or whatever thing if you sit that way you feel at the mercy of the chair the smell thing though I haven't been in one that had that but I could just not see that going well but I, prove me wrong. Well, I mean, everybody thinks you're going to throw up in VR chairs, too, and, and people threaten it all the time, but it rarely happens. I've almost done it with a headset on, but I could just take the headset off and then start feeling better. The last movie I saw in 3D prior to that was when I was a kid. All them dancing chairs. So I had that thought in my mind. 
when I knew Avatar was coming out in 3D. Yeah, that's that's kind of, uh, but like, that's not a new thing. This is something that's been going on for a while, and I don't know when exactly it started, but there's one man that's very famous for doing this um, in the early days of horror film. And that man is William Castle, or William Schloss Jr., uh, and he was born in 1914, so that's going to tell us about how long uh, ago this stuff was going on. What this guy was famous for, though, was selling the films. He had gags that would be installed in theaters. That would be part of the thing. He'd go around getting uh, things installed. But he would also, like, he was kind of, like, known as a showman. So... One of the first big um, ideas he had with this film was that uh, they were going to uh, put out death certificates. They were going to give you, or life certificates, whatever you want to say, so that if you died during watching this movie, uh, it could be collected on $1,000 a piece. And it was like a legit thing, right? And so, it, like, genius. It was genius. It was for the film uh, Macabre in 1958. And so it got a lot of hype, right? And it got everyone going, adding to the immersiveness. Already, like, film is new and on the uh, on big and horror is taking over at that time. But he didn't just stop there, right? He went on, and, and we'll take a look at uh, uh, some of the actual uh, footage of him um, going over this. Another one, a uh, big one, probably like perhaps the biggest uh, film that he's known for anyways is The House on Haunted Hill with Vincent Price. And in this one, they used a, uh, during during the scene where the skeleton comes out of the vat of acid, they use, probably zoom in on here so it makes it easier to read for anyone else. Uh, they use <laughs> they use a, a skeleton, a plastic skeleton. I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure it was a plastic skeleton on ropes that flew through the theater at the same time. And uh, one of the things that I, that I was always mentioned when you're looking at this is like kids would like upon realizing this. Not maybe not the first showing, but the second time the kids would realize this and like take target practice at it with pop and popcorn and whatever else you know they can they could throw at it. Obviously, because. Kids back in the day were so much better than kids now. Remember that. Remember when they always say that that back in oh back in my day, oh, kids knew it. No, 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 no. They were literally causing vandalism in mass in movie theaters. Standardly, how many kids do you know these days that just go around throwing pop and popcorn everywhere in movie theaters? It's a lot more rare nowadays than it was back then. Those kids were out of control, so don't let them tell you otherwise. So the next, the one that I think is probably the most, <laughs> I'm not even letting anyone get words in there. So, <laughs> so the thing hey, that hey, I, <laughs> I, I have strong feelings about baby boomers. I'm not contradicting anything you've said. I've watched all the bullshit they taught themselves in the 1950s, and it's pretty much the same bullshit they're saying now. Their parents should have spanked them more. I don't think anybody else needed it. <laughs> Your parents should have like talked reasonably to them instead of treating them like they were like not right. a human entity. Right. No, I was, I was being facetious. They shouldn't have been spoken spanked, but man, their parents could have done a way better job. And then like we wouldn't have the society we have today. But by digress. It's not just parents, but yeah, I'll agree with you there. There's a that, lot of that generation's parents I have issues with. If I go back in a time machine, I'll slap each and every one of those mofos. We need to go back and switch all the propaganda up that happened. And I think uh, that might help change a lot of things. There's a lot of f fucked up propaganda going on. So we take like the schmoo back to like 1920s and uh, I, I, I got off target. So anyways, the, uh, the, the one that I find is like the most interesting is called the tingler. And Vincent Price is also mm -hmm. in this one. And we'll see why we'll see why it was so interesting. But they put vibration things under the seats. And you'll get to hear exactly why, and you'll get to see what they recreate. But there's a point in the movie where everything, where they basically the the film goes black, and in order to stop the tingler from killing you, 
you had to scream. And that was part of it that was, had been worked into the movie. And so they shut everything off and Vince Price comes on and says, hey, the tingler's in the theater and everyone needs to scream uh, to not die, basically, right? Then we'll, we'll hear what he really says. But what they had rigged up is like these vibration units under certain seats so that randomly people would, it would just start vibrating all of a sudden. And up until that point, no one ever went to a movie theater and had that happen. So even though you knew, you went into it knowing it was just for fun, like it was like, boom, something weird is happening. So then, you know, and it was tied in. It was kind of like a playing of the audience, you know, and then in a few minutes, they'd be like, okay, okay, you know, uh, your screams helped and and we can resume with whatever. And then it continues on from there. I mean, the, the plot is he's basically a mad scientist using LSD to induce nightmares. I mean, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, everybody. <laughs> So some other things he also had were, was like a coward's corner uh, where in theaters, mm-hmm. if people are too afraid, he'd, you know, they'd make you go sit in a corner uh, outside of the theater, in the theater, but outside of the actual like, you know, movie thing. We, we need something like that for just normal everyday shows at bars. I'm surprised people actually went along with it, but times must have been different. Another big film is Mr. Uh, Sardonicus. Uh, And they had some stuff that was with drive-ins. And this one was one that had supposedly had, from what I can tell and from what I've seen, uh, it's all bullshit. But like, supposedly the audience could vote on the ending kind of. So at at one point they could say Mm -hmm. either... Mr. Sardonicus or whoever in the film, they did bad, so we need to punish them, or no, we should let them go free, but no one ever let them go free, so only one ending was ever really aired. Supposedly it was uh, shot. I don't think so, because when you see uh, how it was played back, there's no real place that the film cuts. It just kind of does its thing. Uh, things, um, An image stays on the screen, and then there's no, like, flicker it just moves right into the next scene there's no like you know real change so it looks like it was all just filmed ever is one one big thing uh there were some other ones where uh they had like glasses of different colors so that you could or couldn't see ghosts in a certain film well we'll we'll see how some of those are uh what better uh what better uh Time to look uh, than now at these. So here's just uh, here's some clips of the William Castle picture film. Make sure it's make sure it's loud enough here. Yeah, it's as loud as it's getting. Da 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 da. Your attention, please. During every suspenseful moment of the running of the motion picture macabre, the life of everyone in the theater will be ensured by... Macabre. <laughs> yeah, I gotta replay that again. I, I, can't, I can't say the end of that word like that. I really can't. I can mispronounce it the normal way, but I can't say it like that. It's, what what? It's like... What just happened? It's like, it's like the guy was reading it, but this isn't the first take that they took. Right, and they're right, like, no, they're right, like, right, right. No, 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 no. It said macabre. It said macabre, and he's like, I, I, macabre. No, macabre, macabre. No, dude, macabre. Just say macabre, macabre. Just macabre. It's super easy. Like, all right, all right, I got it. Macabre, macabre, macabre. <laughs> No, there's no r- at the end. Macabre. No. All right. Whatever. Just fucking. Le- we'll just we'll edit it out as twenty best take. We can twenty takes later. They took the best one. The best one. But that's why you can hear that. There's he could just never do it, and that's why there's just that little. Uh, it sounds like somebody edited that. Went in there and physically edited that on the thing on the audio tape. We need a a four D movie about that. <laughs> Lloyd's of London for one thousand dollars against death by fright. However. Even Lloyd All right, hold on, I gotta hear it again. Where's it at? It's too far away. Right? Over here. Your attention, please. During every Cabot. suspenseful moment of the running of the motion picture, Macabre. 
<laughs> See, it's like, That's exactly it's, what we called that. That's exactly what happened. It's just there. from the limited evidence of the last seven weeks. That's exactly what happened. There's just a little snip right on it. Yeah. Well, he got it as close as he could, and he he, he kept saying it, and they were tired. <laughs> so that's what happened. I mean, these things didn't have huge budgets. I mean, that was the whole trick was to try and keep your budget as low as possible and scare the heck and is making as much obnoxiousness as possible and rake in the immediate cash so you can make the next one and pay your bill. For I'm sure. not saying it's a bad life. That sounds like a fun life. <laughs> the one in the theater will be insured by Lloyd's of London for $1,000 against death by fright. However, even Lloyd's of London will not grant coverage for any person with a known heart condition or for suicide by any member of the audience. <laughs> So if you commit suicide, Does that a lot? if you commit suicide, that thousand dollars is null and void. Sorry, sorry. If that's which is kind of weird, huh. because if you were scared so much that you couldn't live with the horrors anymore and you committed suicide, you'd think it would be honored because that meant the movie did its job. Right, right. But this is also like back in the day. So like even admitting to the idea of suicide means you're a bad Christian or whatnot. Or well, that's whatever. what I'm saying. No one would have come forward. So they shouldn't have, they should have just not said that because who's going to be like, yeah, I committed suicide. Can I have a thousand dollars? Like, wait a minute. Well, he's you just playing did. off of everything else for money, just like every other capitalist of that era. I'm a side Here is the guaranteed right. When you go to see my picture, Homicidal, you'll get one of these certificates. Then at the climax of Homicidal, there will be a fright break. If you are too frightened to stay to see the rest of the picture, you can present this certificate at the coward's corner and get your full admission price refunded. Oh, and please, don't reveal the ending of Homicidal to your friends, or they will kill you. If they don't, I will. I could, I could imagine the Karens now. I wasn't afraid. I didn't like it. I want my money back. Well, you see, I think I'm like, not sitting in this I, corner. I want to think that the Karen ratio is probably higher in the 1950s, but without good drone time machine technology, I can't test this. I would, I, looking at some older documentaries, it seems like there's a lot of things that were stopped, but there's so much stuff that was just let go that was like embraced by the good, good Christian right wing people <laughs> that it's just, it, it boggles your mind, especially in like, yeah, just especially in entertainment. It's like, oh, why is that okay? Like, oh, they made some dude made some heated argument one time, convinced a bunch of church people, and then church people got behind it. Maybe they got donations. Who knows what happens? He he wasn't playing either. He really got Lloyd's of London to insure his stuff for those gimmicks. So this is a gentleman that talked Lloyd's of London into yeah, yeah, partnering was, with him. That's crazy. It was, it was <laughs> legit, but, you know. The Palace Theater. Youngstown, Ohio. Here, film fans line up for blocks as Homicidal starts its unprecedented sweep to nationwide popularity. The only picture ever to offer yeah, a money there back too. guarantee for those too frightened to see its shocking climax. Could you could you imagine today if you were like going to see a movie and like you know Ridley Scott's just hanging outside handing out flyers or whatever to promote it? This is this is how far away as a society we've gone. Like this guy that we look on as like a legend was literally just out and about with people. He hired Vincent Price for movies. It's not like he was just some guy making movies in his basement. You know, this isn't like if you went to see the angry video game nerd and James Rolfe was there or something like that. This is like, like I just said, like Steven Spielberg is outside handing out stuff it, it, it's just i think income inequality as i go back to often translates a lot into this i want to people to see that that's the fabric of society that it, it translates to because if this guy was ultra rich do you think he would have been doing this 
No. And if you go back and you look at a lot of stuff at the time, you'll see in action, very smart, interesting, uh, entrepreneurial sorts of creative types that make an empire out of something. And then some rich people that realize the type of money that they're making off that and be like, Hey, I can do that because I could just like spend 10 times the amount of money and make something twice as grand and it'll succeed. And that's a thing that just happens. And because of that happening over and over and over, we get into these situations like this. But that's just an amazing thing to see this guy, essentially Steven Spielberg, or insert any super famous director, not that he was essentially ultra famous at the time, but just say 80s time Spielberg, E.T., he's handing out fucking plush E.T. toys in the theater. You know what I mean? That's like how this would relate. This is just... And and he even Martage's house to make the first movie. <laughs> like, uh, he, so he's so he's on the level of like Kevin Smith, you know, if you will, like uh, sure. that sort of coming from that meager backgrounds of like really putting everything in that they have financially and getting like you know. Well, not not everybody's dad can own a diamond mine or a car dealership. And it's usually better for the art, for the points you've already made. That fucking it, when it's when it's handed and you don't work for it, it's not the same result. That so, diamond mine's a story on its own that I've researched there, for years. There's some weird stuff attached to that. Maybe I'll make a video about it. There, you know, there are certainly exceptions to every rule as well. So you know, I'm not saying every person that has that background utilizes it thusly, but it does give them an advantage another person does not have. It's yeah. a privilege. That's why that's why fiscal fiscal is one of the privileges we talk about. Right. Like just because your grandpa made a ton of money off of Nazis, like hardcore, then then that's how like you have all the money you have. Doesn't mean that you would make those same deals that your grandfather made. Right, right. That too. I mean, money comes from weird places, the nature of money. But if you have that much money, you shouldn't have that much money. No one should have that much money. No more kings. We don't need to have kings. No kings, no kings, I'm, no I'm kings. I'm capping the official planetary income at like or assets and or cash in hand at less than a billion. Yeah, a billion's like way too high for for what you as a person ever could use. I mean, like, think about it. Like, uh, it'd take a long time to go through a million dollars unless you were really trying to fucking ball. Like, if you just lived a life... That was living a life a million dollars less a long ass time, if not but, but more mad, than everyone's life. Scientist labs cost money, so. But if you, if you're sharing that with a bunch of other people, you can't use the lab twenty four seven. You know what I mean? Like you can be doing some stuff I, in there, but there's gonna be enough space and other things going on that other people will be doing it. Plus, your work could be contributing to other people's work. So while they're not using the lab, they're using your work too. So it's there's a lot more to look at it than just trying to say like. Everything ever that I've ever done is solely because of me, because that's a hundred percent not true for anything ever. So many countless human beings died for all of us to be able to do what we're doing with the things that we're doing to allow like a few rich people to fucking like trick us out of like a fair life that we deserve. Peasants had a better life in comparison than what we do. Peasants most, to most kings had, had a most. better life than what we do to Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Totally off the subject. Let's get back to it. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Uh, were you holding his hands throughout the picture? I was holding him back. He was running out. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, did you, uh, did you enjoy the, um, did you uh, guess the surprise ending? I had some ideas about it, but it was, I wasn't sure. How about you? No, I didn't have any idea the way this picture ended. What was the most delightful? She's just out there interviewing people picture. afterwards. Oh, I don't know. I guess the ending sort of built up the whole spin. To me, it was the introduction of Emily as a homicide or homicidal. Oh, do not give the. Oh, Emily is the homicide. All right. Tell me, uh, will you tell your friends the ending of this picture? Oh, no. Never. No, I'll let them suffer through it. Oh, Mr. no. I'd like to congratulate you on a film fine piece of production. I think uh, Alfred Hitchcock is going to have to go a long way to try and talk something like this. Oh. Thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. Uh, would you tell your friends the ending of the picture? Look at that. Yes, That's would the glasses everyone, that everyone's that wearing now. Yes, oh, We're like nice back in the say. 60s where they flip uh, it. Yeah, there you? we go. Like that, the horn rims and stuff. Everyone's wearing that shit again. Would tell your friends the ending of the picture? No, sir. I would uh, ruin it. That is a pump. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Oh, I'd never go home and tell Lenny about this, especially my mother. I want her to come down and see something like this. She'd enjoy it. Uh, tell me, what did you think of Homicide? <laughs> I liked it. And, and you? <laughs> I don't think I'll sleep for a week. And you? It was wonderful. I really, really liked it. It's not that scary, wow. I'm sure. <laughs> tell me, now, from a mother's point of view, you feel that Homicidal was shocking and terrifying, you say. Do you feel that it's all right for your daughter to see this type of motion picture? <laughs> How do you base it? Well, I've always taught Pat that movies Based, are Mom. movies and they should be fun and not to terrify you. That you shouldn't believe in uh, everything you see in the movie. Uh, do you think? Yo, Based Mom from like the 1950s. And that's what I'm saying. Like, people, when we look back at history, people like to think that we're all like crazy, weird right wingers. And while that's. True, that's true for a lot of people. They just wanted to dominate society, much like now. They want to be the loudest when it comes to like spreading the crazy shit. But you have actual people he's interviewing, and this is an older lady, right? Like her daughter was a, definitely a teenager if that was her daughter with her. And she's like, What do you mean? It's it's a fucking story, mate. Like that shit's like not real. Like <laughs> you teach your kids that stories aren't real. <laughs> like well, well, right, but then they, but then they grew up around TV for the next four decades or whatever, and here we are. No, but I'm just saying, like, I don't think that that's changed. Like, my parents never were like, it happened on TV; it's real. Like, I knew people's parents who were like that, who continued the satanic panic on with D and D stuff, right? That, like, even in high school, that were still like D and D Satan worshiping, and it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like. This is like the 90s now or whatever. Late 90s even. So it's just kind of like, what are what are we what are we doing? You know? And so like you look back and you see people like that and you're like, yeah, why weren't those people like the loud voice in society being like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Just because we we're watching like a horror movie or a war movie doesn't mean we're gonna go out to do horror or war, you know? Because the unreasonable people are, are just louder. No, I, I, I understand that. And that's my call to the reasonable people to start being louder and to stop letting unreasonable people steal the narrative. Just like that lady. She didn't, she didn't like that dude. He was like, here's this bullshit narrative. And that's what he was. He was too. He was trying to defeat some of these narratives when you look into him. Cause that was stuff he had to deal with. Right. Like when it, horror movies right. had to deal with a lot of that stuff at that time. And so that's that's why he even hit it with that super right wing conservative viewpoint. And that lady had to go back and be like, yo, what? That's not that's not the standard. This is the standard. Those people are fucking crazy. I think it's fair to and it was and it wasn't the seventies of- yet, so people weren't just saying yo mama to shit like that. Picture <laughs> you like this to your friend. No. Why not? Well, it yeah, well, for one thing, if they're going to see it, it spoils it. And for another thing, let them pay their seventy cents and see it and find out for themselves. Like motherfuckers knew about spoiler alerts way back then. It's not a new thing, all you kids and your spoiler alerts and like not spoiler alerting. How about we just don't do it and we know that's why you put it on there if you're going to talk about it. Spoiler alert. That I'm pretty shit. sure. I'm pretty sure that goes back to prehistory, though. I, I think all these bad habits go back to just the species itself, as opposed to culture. On some level, we're just built like. I'm trying to think what's, what's like a, what's a good way to put it when that would start happening because like selfish little monkeys or selfish little monkeys. I ha- I see that happening on like a micro level when like somebody's telling a story and it's like, Ooh, tell the part about this. And it's like, Hey, wait, we'll get to that part. You know, don't spoil it for everyone else. Like, I guess I can see how that, that could do it. But, but before that with like gossip, I mean, that's just kind of how it spreads. People take the juiciest part of whatever they're trying to, Share and then the right. story from from cave from, from caves that. to now. I mean, I'm sure theft was an issue. Even you know, theft is an issue even outside of different systems of of trade. I mean, we 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 got some bad habits as a species, and that just affects all our culture too. Well, theft and people yeah, take for... advantage of that and make money off it. Well, I mean, but but. Uh, unnecessary theft. It's different when you're surviving. It's different when you're taking stuff to be a dick and being selfish, I think. So, I mean, I guess you could make the argument that maybe all survival is being selfish. But we're not getting into philosophy right now. It's fine. No, no, the, I agree with you there, the minimum amount. But 
uh, there's a minimum amount of selfishness required to survive, but anything beyond right, that. Right, right. But I'm saying we're I well beyond that as a species. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I just, I wouldn't consider that minimal, that absolute minimal amount selfish. But I just don't think, pe I think people move that goalpost of what they think is minimal as like way further than what really is it's, minimal. It's and, the, the human entitlement part, which will like, you know, end up conquering other alien species with our cat flags or whatever. The Karen conquerors. Thank you yeah, very so much. Karen Planet 4, sending the cats. For like, years, they're going to go talk to the manager. You're a similar. a unique way whereby a motion picture audience can actually decide the climax of a picture. I have found such a way. My latest picture, <laughs> Mr. Sodom. They did a joke about this one in Futurama. No audience has ever had before. The power well, even this is just so ironic and funny. Of a character on the screen. The power... It's to punish. It's a meta gag, man. In ancient Rome, yeah, yes, it spectators is. could decree life or death to a gladiator by indicating thumbs up or thumbs down. During or flashing your car lights in the drive-in. The mobs could condemn a man by merely shouting to the guillotine. In the early West, vigilantes took the law into their own hands. Today, for the first time, the awful power to punish will be yours. After you Do see it. the evil events that made Mr. Sodonicus what he was, you will decide what should be done to him. Mr. Sodonicus, in spite of all his cruelties, some people will think he deserves mercy. Well, Others will feel smile. that no punishment could be too severe. When you come to see Mr. Sodonicus, <laughs> you will receive a, a ballad like this. At a certain point in the picture, you will vote thumbs up or thumbs down. His punishment. Look, people were so dumb. They thought that by putting a picture facing the movie projector screen, that somehow the magic people inside would change the film based on what they saw without being able to see you. <laughs> Maybe it was double sided and they hoped the people in the projector <laughs> when the projector booth were gonna change it. There, there supposedly this feeling, was like people that think reality TV, people that think reality TV is real. Right? So like I can tell you it is completely fake. It's so edited and so scripted and so produced. It's not there's no part of reality TV that's reality anymore. Except for they make a real good amount of money on it by not paying people that appear on reality TV. It will depend on the result of your vote. See you at the punishment poll. Gruesome twosome, much unlike a gleesome threesome. Let me show you a few of my latest listings. Now, here's a lovely piece of unimproved property. A small plot in a quiet neighborhood. Oh, his and hers. Just nice. waiting for the right couple. Maybe you. Uh, this costs more money, of course. But it's guaranteed to last for a lifetime. <laughs> of course. And then some. <laughs> now, if you're not afraid of something a little out of the ordinary, and you're in the market for an old, dark house, especially designed by Charles Adams. I've got just the thing for you. The Amazing World. Emerge -o! This is when the skeleton flies at you. The last one that I wanted to show here is the Tingler. I'm William Castle, and I feel obligated to warn you about the next attraction you will see at this theater. The picture is the Tingler, which I directed. And for the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. You will feel some of the physical reactions the shocking sensations experienced by the actors on the screen. 
I guarantee that the Tingler has more shocks per minute than my last film, The House on Haunted Hill. But don't be alarmed. You can protect yourself. When you see the picture, you will be told and remember the instruction how you can guard yourself from attack by the Tingler. And now may I show you a few scenes from the Tingler? Great ambient noise for my basement. Ah, <laughs> uh, Why don't they have a voiceover doing that? It makes so much more sense if you had the the tingler will break loose in the theater while you were in the audience. You know, like that sort right, of stupid was, thing going he on. He was always pushing envelopes though, so he's not gonna do the same thing every time. <laughs> it's a missed opportunity with having Vincent Price do the voiceover for it. <laughs> What that scene was that she didn't scream. That's is he like a burn victim? I gotta see that movie. I've never actually seen it. That's but like I need the buzzer under my seat for full effect. So maybe if, someday. If, if, if he Maybe they should play him in the VR rides at the malls. Because then you could add the buzzer to the appropriate moment during the movie. I mean, it'd be pretty easy to clip it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other problem with that is, like, you know the buzzer is going to happen, to. I don't know. We need a new... Here's what I'm saying. We need somebody else to take up the reins of William Castle and to start employing things like this. We don't need this stupid, over-the-top... 4DX theater. We need somebody to, to actually do it artistically to put care and love into it, not just like some faceless corporation with money doing it. We need, you know, well, I know it's going to take some lot, money, but a lot of the most innovative like devices like that outside of the main ones being produced for theaters right now for that X generation experience, like our little guys for the most part, small companies. Thomas Vincent Savini, a.k.a. the godfather of gore, was born on November 3rd, 1946 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I love that shot. He, you know, I didn't even realize till I was doing my research that that was even him because I haven't had a fin- copy of Fangoria in 20 years. And, you know, that's a problem that also needs to be resolved, I think. <laughs> so so for proper props, I now need a Fangoria and a, a Shutter account. Um. Mr. Savini's done a lot of stuff over the years. Um, the actor, special effects, wizard, stuntman, director, prosthetics designer. Tom Savini was born in Pittsburgh, inspired by the Man of a Thousand Faces, 1957. Uh, young Savini became fascinated with the magic and illusion of film. 
He spent his youth in his room creating characters by tirelessly practicing makeup. Later, as a combat photographer in Vietnam, Savini saw firsthand the gruesome carnage for which he later gained fame, simulating it on screen. He has acquired a remarkable cult following among film fans, primarily due to his groundbreaking special effects in the splatter movie explosion of the early 1980s, along with fellow special makeup legends Dick Smith and Rob Botton. Savini is one of the key special effects people behind the startling makeup and EFX seen in the fantasy horror genre films of the 1980s and 90s. He was heavily influenced by the remarkable silent era actor Lon Chaney, and he sought to emulate the amazing theatrical makeup effects that were a hallmark of Chaney's career. In Savini's insightful book, Grand Illusions, he speaks of his early attempts at applying prosthetics to his face using spearmint gum, having misinterpreted that he was meant spirit, to actually spirit use spirit gum. Spirit gum. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, he, he's got everything else, and that's the mistake he made. You know, I mean, it is what it is. That's hilarious. Dude, I could get that, though, because people say, people say weird stuff and pronounce things weird. So, like, you might pick up whatever, like how people say pillow and milk and things like that, where people just kind of, like, pick it up, and then they think that that's what it is. You know, right, it's like right, a Rickyism. Right. Buffalo wing. That's a bad example. (laughs) His first work was a low-budget fair providing special effects and makeup for independently made horror films such as Deranged, Confessions of a Necrophile, and Martin from 1976. He really caught the attention of horror buffs with his grisly effects in the cult George A. Romero-directed zombie film Dawn of the Dead, and then in the controversial slasher film Friday the 13th. The movie generally identified as the kickstart for the aforementioned splatter movie genre. Savini also contributed in special effects such thrillers as Maniac from 80, The Burning 1981, Creepshow 1982, and Romero's third dead film, Day of the Dead 1985, for which he won a Saturn Award. Savini directed his feature film debut, Night of the Living Dead 1990, which was the remake of the zombie classic. Not content with only being behind the lens, However, Savini has appeared in dozens of films, can be seen demonstrating his capable acting skills as Morgan the Black Knight in Knight Riders in 81, as Blades, one of the biker gang members of Dawn of the Dead, and as Sex Machine, which we saw from Dust Till Dawn and the amazing Phallus Gun. Yeah, that's a great movie. He's, he's done a lot of good movies, both as like, you know, his acting career is actually really large. Oh my God, is he the teacher in Twisted Sisters video? <laughs> that can't be right. Who knows? Come on, um, Creep Show 2. And here's a nice curated list of some of Tom Savini's top 10 horror special effects by a channel by the name of Bird Hands. Tom Savini is a master of illusion. His contributions to horror films and special effects are legendary. From zombies to slashers, his work is both influential and iconic. And most importantly, still looks impressive years later. Join me as I count down my top 10 Tom Savini special effects. Number 10, The Prowler. There's a bunch of great kills in The Prowler, and I classified in a trio of films Savini did where the kills are really nasty and mean, along with Maniac and The Burning. Not fun type kills where you laugh after them, but more super violent and realistic that leave you feeling horrible. This shotgun blast is a perfect example. <laughs> That's Number realistic. Nine, Friday the 13th. Kevin that looked like super, it was then. <laughs> that looked like so over the top. It was like I expected just like a fountain of blood, like um, Evil Dead style to just start coming out. There was so much. Well, that's, that's. I mean, that's one of the reasons people didn't that's like amazing. Evil Dead, though, too, because it like took that oh, next yeah, step. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, he just framed it as realistic and it's like, uh, <laughs> that's realistic. Well, but, it, but, but at the time, these guys were cutting edge. It was the closest he could do without making an actual snuff film at the time. It looks awesome though. I give it that. Like One of Savini's main tricks he likes to include in his effects is using as much of the real actor in the effect as possible. He uses this to its maximum when killing Kevin Bacon and combining a real head and a fake chest and neck. Uh, it even today. That's, that is good. This kill must well, have been the audiences that in the 1980s squirming in their seats. Number eight. Good shot. Rick. Except that very last one, it, his neck got really long for some reason. But that's that's just my opinion. Otherwise, like the first time when it comes through, I had no idea like how he did that effect. It's like, whoa, that's good. 
And then, then the second one, you're like, oh, okay, his neck got long. But. Rick the Prick, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Yeah, I know it's not Rick the Prick who gets the chainsaw in the head, but his best bro does. This effect is amazing, but also it's a bit different because you don't see the saw actually make impact, which makes it kind of better because you think they got away for a second until the top of this guy's head starts falling off. <laughs> Again, making use of the real actor, then a fake head with real hands. Top-notch stuff. Number seven, Maniac. In this horrific shotgun kill, it's Tom himself who takes the 12-gauge. The maniac leaps onto the hood of the car and blows Savini's head off in slow motion. And this headshot is disgusting. Savini shot what a the fake head himself with a real 12-gauge shotgun. And the film crew had to take off before the police showed up. Because they had no money to do it. Now that's devotion. To yeah, the that's what I'm talking about. Number six, creep show. That's how it's got to be. He loves to make creature effects just as much as he loves his splatter stuff. And in Creepshow, an entire segment is devoted to one of his best ever. Fluffy is an eating machine inspired by the Tasmanian devil. Yeah, it I remember this great. one it from a kid. Like a real animal that Never forget it. Yes. People as opposed to if you're cold, they're cold. Something. Bring them inside. And as great as it is in the movie, it looks even better in behind-the-scenes footage and pictures that I've seen of it. I think this is due to the comic book lighting in the movie. Maybe one day we'll see Fluffy return under brighter yeah. lighting. Alternate to Harry in the, the Hunter scenes. Hunter scenes. It's not very often you see a slasher kill multiple people at once. But in the burning, the killer somehow floats his way over in a canoe to a raft with a bunch of kids on it. He stands up with his edge clippers and... <laughs> that was such a brutal clipping of the fingers. It worked so well. Holy that's, that's, shit. That's why he makes me think of, of Tokyo Gore, like the movies that like Tokyo Gore police or like, you know, some of the other movies like that stuff's descended from this. Like you would have never had like pole dancing fights up zombies. If not for stuff like this. Good Hell driver. Time. I was trying to think of the movie Hell driver. Yes. In the first five minutes, I'm spoiling the first five minutes. There is a pole dancing zombie fight. Like, but it's the zombie. That's the pole. I don't even know. <laughs> Just stab. I, I pulled my back muscle and kicked a cat off the bed. The first five minutes of that movie, and I went back and watched Tokyo Gore Police first, and then eventually came back to Hell Driver. I'm sorry, Minnie. The editing and effects in this are amazing and come out of nowhere. This fairly dull movie would be forgotten by now if not for this memorable scene. Number three. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, Jason's death. This effect has many elements to make it great. First, the action slows down for a second while Tommy Jarvis tricks Jason. And then Trish grabs the machete and takes a swing at his face, but hits the mask instead. This is when we get a glimpse of the deformed face, which is a masterpiece of makeup on its own. But then he gets hit in the side of his head with the machete and falls to his knees, and then face first to the ground, pushing the machete even more into the face and head. Amazing. The impact hit is a reverse shot. Then to the actor with a machete in his face reacting. Then a life-size full-body puppet for the head being sliced. Considering at the time people were going to the movie with the promise of Jason getting killed permanently, <laughs> this did not disappoint anyone. That's and it's shocking shot. that the censors let them show as much of it as they did. Number two. It's too bad that they had to kill Sloth like that, though. I mean, Sloth was... Arguably the Goonie with the most heart. He was just a little misunderstood. And I don't know. Day of the like Dead. That. Day of the Dead is Savini's best work by far, and the entire movie is flawless in the effects department. But most of the effects are basically perfected versions of things we've seen before. But the two zombies that are being experimented on by Logan are showstoppers. One has his whole head scraped away except for the brain, but still has a fully intact body that you can see moving. And the other has the stomach fully removed. And when he sits up, all the guts spill out of it all over the floor. <laughs> That's so this awesome. This is disgusting and amazing at the same time. It's done by having some of the actor inside the table, but enough of his real body on top that he can move around. I realize there are many more great effects in this movie, but I felt that these were the most original. They've never been done before this, and they've never been done after. They're flawless the first time out. Number one, <laughs> Friday funny, the 13th, yeah. Jason. Now, I know some people will disagree with this, but hear me out. Tom Savini, in my opinion, is directly responsible for this movie turning into the most successful horror franchise of all time. 
Hmm. Nowhere in the original script is Jason described as being deformed. His appearance is truly frightening, and you only kind of see it earlier in the film. So when he comes up from the water at the end and pulls Alice under, you're seeing Tom Savini's creation, not the director's. In my hey opinion, you're you not judging the special effect on the actual effect that it has on the audience, <laughs> then this is by far his greatest Road? achievement. Even Savini has said that they would be waiting outside the screenings of the movie, and they'd hear the crowd scream at the top of their lungs when Jason came out of the water. Giving that extra layer to the character of Jason helped this movie and the character become a worldwide phenomenon and cultural icon that is still huge today. And you can't get bigger than creating an icon. He has a school. Um, so he, he decided to create a school in his hometown, in a, or not a school, a program at his college in his hometown of Pittsburgh. And he has a pretty successful program he's been running for a while. I believe we have a trailer of it. Yeah, I'm on the website right now flicking through. It looks looks like there's like a bunch of different options. Well, I'd and... expect there's, there's different parts of special effects we go into now as opposed to having to do them all yourself. <laughs> Here's the video. <laughs> Not dissing doing them all yourself. <laughs> It kind of takes back to whenever I started special effects. It was the only thing that really I was really ever serious about. And knowing that this school gave a degree really helped me with my decision. Well, the thing that really made me want to come here was the work that came out of it. Not only was there amazing sculptures and molds and everything like that, but the fashion and performance pieces for the Cirque and the bridal even was spectacular. And it wasn't just two things that you learn in the movie making makeup industry it was a diverse range of almost everything when you look online like you can see photos that. of the school but nothing compares to when you come in actually see it in real life i think the way they have the building set up it promotes creativity instead of being like a normal <laughs> paint classroom you get creative juices flowing with like all this cool stuff around you the projects here are the coolest projects one is just work on any kind of movie monster or film character and sculpt it. I actually think our students get spoiled sometimes because, you know, they have this giant special effects lab down the street. This is a film studio. This is like the old days of MGM or Paramount. They're making movies here. They need makeup oh, artists. That's awesome. Here is a film program, and there's an assembly line of makeup artists in the makeup effects program. What I like to see sometimes is when a film student's like, you know, I have this idea and they've kind of become friends with the Savini student. He says, well, I'd like to build that. And then it just happens. And the support levels are phenomenal. That goes across the board for all of Douglas. Z versus uh -oh. where we're going as far as design. It's a 3D object that you're working with in a 2D space. The amount of time that you're going to spend in ZBrush as opposed to working in clay, like there's really no comparison. It's so fast. You can go through so many different designs. And these labs are open. They can come in and build stuff all they want. Everything we do here is completely hands-on. If we want to learn how to do something, we just ask the instructors and they'll show us anything we want to do. Most of the classes are smaller and if there's a big class, they usually try and divide it. So that way they're able to walk around and talk to all of us individually. I love my teachers because any question that I have, especially that I speak Spanish and if I have to ask 10 times, they will explain things to me 10 times. So Tom actually does come here quite a few times. One time I was in here in Beards and he stopped by my uh -oh. desk and he saw me uh -oh. struggling and like holding the head. He comes here quite a few times is to me telling me he's never there. <laughs> if they specifically say he comes here often, you know he doesn't come there that often. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds kind of cynical to me. I, I I'd rather oh. I'd rather get some ground on the floor reporting. I'm I'm sure you so, see him some and meet apple him. some apple air tags and I'm just joking. Ed and trying to work and he showed me his own personal like technique and doing it faster and all of that. So like from Tom Savini, you know, like the face of the school, I got to get like a one on one lesson from him and learn from him. Within the program we have in third semester called yeah. Phase Screen. Phase Screen is everything from concept to creation. It's a simulated environment of a real special effects shop. That's it what I want to do. It trains the individual to be ready for the industry. So 
understanding the background of what we do, not only as effects artists, but also as, in a, uh, a filmmaking aspect, they have to work in groups and work together, learn the value of teamwork, and also what it's like dealing with stress on the job. Also having deadlines that have to be met. And without any excuses, everything has to be done on time. And they produce some amazing things. And the results are directly behind us. Is that a Chaos Space Marine? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like one. <laughs> they pride themselves on not making a cookie cutter portfolio, then making one that is individualized to you and your special needs and how your creative process works. And so it's really nice coming to a place that's not just book center focused. It is truly about who you are as an artist, what you want to create as an artist, and what you want to do outside of these walls. Douglas Education Center. Anything but order. There you go, kids. Go sign up. Any, Douglas Education Center. Anything but. I've curated a few relevant trailers from the trailer to the movie that influenced Savini's interest in becoming a makeup artist and prosthetic designer to some of his very first gore work, to some of his very first acting work, to, well, my favorite, the Texas Chainsaw Master. Yes, Lon Chaney was all of these. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Miracle Man, the Phantom of the Opera. The world, fascinated and thrilled, called him the Man of a Thousand Faces. But what was the secret Lon Chaney hid behind his thousand faces? What was the mystery in his life? What a good boy. Now, for the first time, the true story, torn from his heart, comes to the screen. Starring James Cagney, magnificent as the fabulous Lon Chaney, master of the grotesque, the weird, the strange. And Academy Award winning Dorothy Malone and lovely Jane Greer as the two women who made his life more astounding, more touching than any of his unforgettable roles. I come to see you every week. Every week. I promise you. And that was the last time he Bye. saw him. Damn you. Who are you? Damn you all I've to hell! I've come to collect my wife. Give me back my wife. So he collected her. I'm glad, like, that music doesn't happen when drama happens now. Maybe that's part of the problem with the world. Maybe if there was more epic, like classical style movie music when drama happens, we can just make that happen technologically through augmented reality, maybe. Costs a lot of money. I'll tell you that. Costs a lot of money because you need all those people there to record whatever you're going to record. Am I supposed to intro the next thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> like I was waiting for like a third person to show up and tell me what to do for a half a second there. <laughs> like we're, we're waiting on, Oh, Oh, <laughs> so the second one would, would, uh, it's basically a variation on the monkey's paws, the death dream trailer. Death stream. I've never seen this one. I'm going to have to traumatize my partner. Dead of night. The story of one night in a small town that changed the lives of many and ended the lives of some. <laughs> no. As night fell, something evil descended upon the town. Something corrupt, unspeakable. Behind their drawn curtains, they waited as fear walked in the dead of night. The chair was rocking by itself. The chair. I was just shoot the chair. Hello. Hello. 
don't know who I am. What a twist. Where you headed? Oh, I'm a soldier. Come on, okay. Dun, 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 dun. Ch -ch -ch -cack. Home. I don't even know who Andy is. Doesn't even know he's home yet. He'll be so surprised. But Andy wouldn't kill anybody. No. Woody. Uh, I mean, it is Andy we're talking about after all. Right. You gotta watch out for Andy. Oh, I can tell. You're okay, Mr. Candle. Boy went away to fight. Did you have the Did you have the puzzle box? Something unspeakable. Hellraiser Dead of Night. Hellraiser 18 Dead of Night. Dead of Night. Starring Academy Award winners John Marley. Bob Marley's younger brother. Uh uh okay. <laughs> I mean, like, that, I don't recognize him, but okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, Richard Backus is Andy, of course. Introducing, that's why I didn't know who he was. Had a budget of $300,000. We could make a dozen of those for $300,000. I don't know. If that's 300000 back then, well, that's like a million dollars now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the dream, but somehow that was Dead of Night, a.k.a. Death's Dream, a.k.a. There's something about Andy. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, when you go to horror movies, because of the distribution, the way it worked back in the day, you'll have different versions of the movies, like, or called different things, like Freak Maker, something, the Mutanoid is another version, like, but it's the same movie with starring Tom Baker and um, that guy from that plays the president and escape from New York. That it's a guy. mad botanist. He's a mad botanist in that movie. That guy. I mean, if you're a mad botanist, I can see why being a college professor is effective because, you know, you have like students right there bringing them back to your mad botany lab, but I digress. Our next one is Martin. Um, I believe he actually directed Martin. and produced this one. I loved that show. Oh, it was My directed man. and written by George A. Romero. It was the first time I think they worked together at all. I think they worked on the, the day shortly after Martin. <laughs> that didn't happen in this reality. That's a butterfly effect. So I'm Martin sure. Lawrence stars in the Martin original theatrical trailer. This is Martin Lawrence meets Tom Savini. Pat Nixon. I, I'd be a lot more excited if this was like a Martin Lawrence. Uh, well, Tom we could, we could just fly out to film. Cali and pitch it to him to redo the movie starring him as a comedic project in 2022 and probably like make it fly. It'd be like Bad Boys 4 or 5, but we won't use Will I, Smith at all. At I, all. I still think we should like just go ahead and go to California for a week this summer and just pitch every dumb bad movie idea we have. But. Pen Mm. Maybe if, when I start leaving my house, we'll. Well, right, right. No, there's that factor too. I mean, I'm supposedly going to see Gary Newman in 11 days or 13 days or something. Let's <laughs> just start this. Then there's a, then there's a Viking rave in September that is like a synthesizer consensus group board dark wave thing called Cold Waves weeks later so i have to skip getting sick a bunch of times 
So I get it. Yeah, I, I live I live in Indiana. <laughs> it's dumb here too. <laughs> I'm playing this. I was playing this each time, just so you know. I'm, it's not paused because I'm trying to be quiet. I'm just like, you're fine. You're fine. I'm 84 years old. People think I'm crazy when I tell them how old I am. It's a little quiet. I'd like to be normal. I just have a sickness. My the way hand. I survive is by drinking blood. You're so crazy. You could easily turn this into a vehicle for him. Yeah, take that syringe, sucker. What if we get what if we get Neil Damon to retweet it? I think as I get older, I get better. I haven't been caught yet. Martin, another kind of Martin. understand what's wrong. They think that I'm a monster. I think I'm a vampire. He, well, he sounds like he sounds like Dave from Kids in the Hall. He does. What if what if all right, so what if we remade this movie? But we have Martin right. Lawrence play Martin, but then he's voiced by Dave from Kids in the Hall. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh like my God. overdubbed. He can make that work. No, yeah. no, for real. But then Martin voices then, somebody else too. And that's got to be a we, part of it. And then we, you have to vote on the ending. Yeah, no, for real. And we can actually make that happen because I've seen people do that nowadays. Like James Rolfe did uh, Angry, yeah, yeah, Angry yeah. Video Game Nerd where you clicked on a thing on the YouTube video and it took you to either A or B for the ending. Right, right, right. Oh, it's much easier now. There are lots of ways you can do it. Martin! Those things I see in the movies are not real. I don't have a whole lot of women. Gina. I used to watch them. I watch them a lot all the time. I have to. Oh, that's not good. To be sure that nothing goes wrong. I follow them. I plan. I'm very careful. It's like that police song or sting song. Every breath you take, I'll be watching you. It's, it's, assuming he's a vampire that can breathe, depending on the mythology. What's he, what's he shooting him up with? Martin! What's he shooting him up with? Probably just ketamine. Just ketamine. Window, window, clean, window cleaner. I do need blood. We all need blood, don't we? Martin! From the director of Night of the Living Dead. Martin! Yeah. Nice delay. Well, I was going to say they needed to turn the feedback down, the delay down just a hair. It's a little... Yeah. I'm, I, I, like, I like the effects so wet, everybody drowns in, tor- in horror. But if they would have used another delay on top of that one, because then they could have had a slower and a fast delay. So, like, it also had a nice, quiet build down. This is me. What do I know? I mean, we could make that. That, was, that one only cost 250000 And Martin Lawrence is going to want 250000 or more. I mean, that's... No, no. The, be, we have to figure out how to, like, get him to, like, not want 250000 or whatever. We gotta, we gotta figure out how to make it appeal to him. <laughs> that way, the idea of it makes him the money. That way, he feels good about doing it. That's what we need to do. All right, so we'll pitch it to him like this. We'll, we'll tell him it's Bad Boys Four, except it's two of him. It's two of him instead of Will Smith. So, like, there is no Will Smith stealing any of his screen time. Right, like, right. Call him. It's Martin. In fact. It's going to be called Bad Boys 4. You can Martin. play that. You can play Martin. that through the dichotomy, the dichotomy of his voice and David's voice because he can play both characters and they can well, just be voiced even though they're him. We're not going to tell him that his voice isn't going to, I, I think he won't sign on. Like, well, well, I, I, we'll I just, think if you, if you, if you produce the story and the character right, he'd actually even agree to that. Do we know they have a, a relationship at all? 
You know, I don't know. I just, I just don't think. I think if we're taking away Will Smith to give him the the um, the stardom and then taking away his voice, he, I don't. I think that he wouldn't. But we won't. Will, he won't know that we're going to do it. Will Smith post. did iRobot, so I mean, you know, you can say what you're. I'm just, I'm just joking. All right. So the last trailer we have, Lee's favorite of the four. Burn her like a rat. Hopefully, is something I yell on my deathbed because of this movie. So right here, if you're not 17, I guess you shouldn't be watching this trailer. If you weren't 17 and 19, like 80, right, right. I don't think I have to. Do you have to log into it? Because I'm. you're allowed to like. There's so much more stuff that's allowed now that 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 wasn't allowed. Right, right. So here we go, kids. Here we go, kids. Uh, Let your parents know. Get their guidance, I guess. Make them watch it with you. 13 years years ago, audiences across America were horrified by the savagery of a faceless killer. Hold on, hold on. While I was a little bit, it was... the weird thing about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that, like, the killers are kind of endearing in a weird sort of way. It's not that you're just, like, straight up horrified by them. And that's, I think, kind of the the draw to it is because you're like, Leatherface, you realize, is, like, mentally handicapped. Like, the first one you, the first well, brother that you meet is. he's got a terrible is, family. Right, right, right. Right, but like the first one you meet is, but like it's still like, oh well, this guy seems like he can kind of function. He's just a weirdo, and then you meet Leatherface, and you're like, oh, this dude's like, he like he has these lovable qualities, these lovable family qualities, but he also is just like, not sane, <laughs> not close like the other guy. He has no reason of like how the reality and whatever works. Well, I mean, there's a history of like royalty and families and doing stuff like that. So, I mean, you can see that happening in in a context like this. I think that's one of the reasons why it works, even though it's such a ludicrous story. And, you know, but Texas is a ludicrous place. Well, I, yeah, I'm just contrasting with the guy that says in the trailer where it's like that. But I was like, well, I don't that, that's a little bit different than Jason, uh, which was talked about earlier, which is like there isn't any endearing qualities about Jason. Like you feel bad for him being like. But it's not like you're like, oh, that Jason, like when you're seeing leather, like I feel like when you see Leatherface in the first one, like you feel for him. Like you don't ever feel for Jason in any of the movies. Even you're like, oh, that's why he's fucked up. But you're not like, oh, I feel bad for him because they don't really do that portrayal. But there's like a human element. I don't know to me with Leatherface that gives that. And with the whole family. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I, I, I'd like to also toss a shout out to the band first Jason that actually has the guy that played Jason that pops out of the boat that what's his face made up. That's funny. Sorry, Mr. Speedy, I just called you what's his face. But it like literally has a band called First Jason and they're still around. Almost opened for them. He vanished. Now, after more than a decade of silence, he has come out of hiding. So, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The buzz is back. Directed by Toby Hooper. Yeah. The buzz is back. The what the hell does back. that mean? I, I, I don't know. Well, buzz, buzz meant something different in the 80s. It meant like a lot of excitement. No, I mean, I I'm not saying it doesn't mean the same thing now, but it's a different <laughs> excitement. Uh, that's it. Yeah, that's just that's funny. That is funny. We're we're buzzing about buzzes in two hundred twenty two. Yeah, I'm gonna watch that that movie again uh, this week. It's probably. amazing. It's it's like, I mean, it's not like make out with like you know the skinless girl on the mattress <laughs> sort of Hellraiser sort of stuff, but. <laughs> It's but, uh, just a way different sort of movie. So, like, that's kind of why I like. Um, I mean, you can obviously tell Rob Zombie was like ultra influenced by Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If anything, like, that's a 
like if you look at any movies, I think that one influences his work the most. Like he's, what he's, he's trying the, to he's recreate. The, he's the family that you're talking about. That glimmer that was there in the actual like actual family of Leatherface. Had they been good people with all those idiosyncrasies, there you have uh, Rob Zombie. Oh yeah, yeah, like came from Carno, Carney background and stuff. Yeah, but I'm like, right, right. and you really see it in. I mean, obviously, Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses is like literally that movie. I mean, that, that it's just it's you know it's just a retelling kind of of those and right. reimaginations, <laughs> and that's his best work in my opinion. Well, he was like, influenced by the the same thing lots of us were in the the eighties. He did a damn good job seeing his influences realized in his own remix, certainly. Yeah, the, but that's where I think the strength of Tank, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is. Like, there's there's a lot of weaknesses to it. Like, <laughs> oh, the, the first one is what I'm referring to. But like, right, I think right. that the like human level of love for like the bad guys is such like a thing that elevates so many good films, you know, like when you can really identify and you actually kind of feel for the bad guy, even though like you shouldn't and you don't really like, you don't not with their goals, but you like, you know, feel with them along the way. Right. Right. It's basically shadow work chronicles. We're making, we're, we're identifying with the person that we don't want to be or admit who we are. Yeah. Or have a facet of that makes sense to us. But if a good writer can do that, a good writer will make you question even your perceptual self because everything's not black and white. Things aren't binary. Yeah. So to recap what needs to be done now with horror, somebody needs to take the idea of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the idea of R William Castle with obviously with the skills of Tom Savini, but make more, a new... More smell. Make a new theater event where they combine this haunted house stuff that everyone works on, but like actually make it a theater sort of thing and like going on. So like, you know, you're watching and all of a sudden like chainsaw comes through the chair and cuts your leg off or something. It'd be fantastic. I mean, it'd be like, holy shit. And only one person, because if you do it to everyone, everyone's expecting it. It's not so exciting. Just like the tingler. So like, but if like one of them has a chainsaw that comes up and somebody's leg gets removed, that's like, holy shit, dude, that was amazing. It was terrifying. I don't know if that business model will apply in these times. It should. It, 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 there may not be a, a happy ending to... We're getting there. It's going to be reality TV. It's going to end up being a punishment. So they're going to combine that with like um, Saw. So it's going to be like, uh, okay... Augmented reality TV. We have this horror movie that we made for these death row inmates and they all have to sit in here. They've signed off and half of them are going to get killed, but they don't know which ones and they get to pick the seats and they don't know what's going to happen in the movie. And, and the half are going to get killed in these weird ways, all from the 4D experience of the movie that they're watching. And so that you get to watch the people watching the movie and the death. So it's like, what's that running man? But like, I, that's where we're at right now. Well, here's the here's the double capitalization on that. Like people could subscribe to the game that they could be like in the VR feeling. OK, so now we add what's that movie? Um, Strange Days. So like you plug in and you can be one of the people that are possibly getting killed and you can get the experience of that as well. But you don't. Die. Well, that's the next generation. As we head into like real smart computer home technology, you're just going to be able to ask for shit like that. I want to be the guy in the last Boy Scout with the gun at the beginning of the movie. And then you can do that in VR and relive like your glory days of football and the one touchdown you got by shooting everybody in the other team, I guess. I don't know. Thanks, Bruce Willis. Real good lessons for our kids, man. Yep. And with that, I think uh, that's how I'll end the show. With Thanks, Bruce Willis. Thanks. But like, uh, subscribe. Follow, poke. No, don't poke. Bother people you don't know you don't like. Bother people you do know you wait, do wait, like. Wait. Bother Bruce Willis. Bother him. He deserves mention, it. Mention the anti oct dispenser. I hear he's a menace to work with. And until he hires me, I'm going to keep saying that. If he wants to hire me and then I can see if that's true or not. But from what I understand, from people that worked with him that I believe, Bruce Willis, not the greatest guy to work with. So thanks, Bruce Willis. Just to remember, for every Captain Planet, there's a Captain Pollution. <laughs>